Let's take a moment and pray together. God, we thank you for all that you've done, and we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives, in our hearts, and in the world around us, even though sometimes it's difficult to perceive it. We trust that you are always with us and that you do walk with us. We pray that in these moments that we might hear a word from you, whether through me or in spite of me, that you will speak here this morning because your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. As much as we hate to admit it, we can't do life by ourselves. It's a hard thing for us to confess to each other, but that's the reality. It's just not possible. You know, when I go to preach a text, uh, it's not uncommon for me to go back and look at what I've said about that text before. It's a good way of kind of starting to gather up my thoughts and seeing if there's anything that I said that was maybe useful or anything that I said that was kind of dumb um, that I don't want to repeat. I've not preached this text before in this church but when I went and looked, the last time I preached it was at a funeral. And I was thinking about that funeral. It was uh, for a young man who died of an overdose. And I thought for a while about that. And my message then, as today, was essentially stay connected. Stay connected to Jesus, stay connected to one another. I am the vine, and you are the branches, Jesus says. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a pretty clear and strong statement. One of the clearest and strongest, probably in all of John's gospel, which is not known for its particular clarity. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we don't particularly like hearing that because we're convinced that we can handle life for the most part on our own. Now, obviously, since we're here in church this morning, we have an understanding maybe that's different than the majority of people out in the world. But we still forget. There are times when all of us forget. But on a very basic level, we might ask ourselves the question, how could we ever expect to do anything amazing anything wonderful with our lives without first acknowledging the one who gave us that life, the one who's at work in us. So last week we talked about shepherds and sheep and we talked about the whole kind of biblical history of those images and there's an equally rich imagery that goes with this week's idea of vines and vineyards. And it starts very early in the history of Israel. I mean, you might go back to Genesis chapter 6. Noah plants a vineyard when he gets out of the ark. That's what he does. He plants a vineyard. You can talk about when Israel came up out of slavery in Egypt, how they sent some spies ahead to scope out this land and see what it was exactly that God was giving them. And so what Moses said to those he sent as spies was spy out the land and see whether, see whether the fruit of this land is good or bad. Bring back something from there so that we can see what the place is about. And so as the story goes uh, from Numbers 13, I think it is, when the spies return, they bring back a bunch of grapes that's so large that they have to carry it on a pole between two men, right? That's how the story is told. In this other passage from Deuteronomy, Moses lists conditions under which people can be exempted from service in the army. And one you might expect is, you know, if you have a young man who's been engaged to be married but is not yet married, please let him go and celebrate his wedding, and then after that he can, he can become part of the army. But there was another exemption, actually, for someone who had just planted a vineyard that had not yet produced fruit. They were permitted to skip military service for that period of time until they could at least taste the first fruit of those vines. So the fruit of the vine, grapes, winemaking, they weren't just important agricultural pursuits. They became really powerful symbols of God's blessing on the land and God's blessing, in fact, on the nation. 
So one of the things that I remember when we were in uh, the Holy Land, when I was in Capernaum, uh, there's an ancient synagogue there. And there are pieces preserved of this synagogue. And I think we have a picture here. Um, so this is part of what you'd call a frieze that would go around the outside, the top, the place where the wall meets the uh, roof. And these wrap around. And you can see right in the center there is a picture of a, a, a cluster of grapes. There's pomegranates on the right, a flower on the left, and in the center of this uh, cluster of grapes. And there were several of these pieces that were just like that. Contemporary historians from uh, Jesus' time talk about how in the temple there was a magnificent golden vine that was over your head when you walked in. So as you entered into the temple during Jesus' time, you would have seen this golden vine over your head. So last week I said in talking about Jesus' good shepherd statement that I think that that kind of having all that biblical background helps us to understand why Jesus said, I'm the true, or I'm the good shepherd last week. This week, I think it also helps us to understand why he says, I am the true vine. Even though the context is a little bit different, in this, in this passage, Jesus is only talking to his disciples. He's still saying, I'm the true vine. It seems as though by saying that, instead of saying, I am the vine, and he says, I'm the true vine. He's contrasting himself with something. We're not 100% sure why. But again, my thought is it's probably the religious establishment, those around who thought that they had understood who God is and what God is about. But there's definitely an edge to him saying, I am the true vine. We can't read this without thinking about Isaiah chapter 5, if you know anything about the Old Testament, Israel itself is described as a vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? So you have God, through the prophet, speaking to the nation and saying, you are my vineyard. I've done everything right in planting you here. I've taken care of you. I've made all the conditions right so that you can produce good fruit. And so God wants to know, why is it that I'm no better off than if I had just let the wild grapes grow up? What difference has it made that I've done all this work in you, Israel? Why do my people think only of themselves? Why do they care nothing for justice? Why do they mistreat each other? Why is this working this way? And so God finally reaches this conclusion. I would have done just as well to settle for wild grapes because that's what I'm getting anyway. And I would have saved myself a whole lot of work. Now, I don't know that things have much changed in between the time that Isaiah wrote these words in the 8th century B.C. and now. I mean, they certainly should have if what it is that we say about Jesus is true, that in him God really came and walked on this earth, walked among us. Not only did he teach us how to live, but he also showed us the meaning of that life by laying down his life for us. I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. And apart from me, you can do nothing, at least nothing good. Now we know that all of us go through times when we feel like there is nothing in us that's that's worth anything, when we're not ourselves, when we're angry, when we're frustrated, when we're depressed, when there's absolutely no grace in us, when there's no patience in us, when there's no forgiveness in us. We get wrapped so tight that there is no longer any room for any joy in anything. In those moments, we are going off the rails because we're disconnected from God. And we know how that feels to be disconnected from God. But there is hope in this passage. 
and it is a great hope. There's something that jumped out at me in reading this again, this time. In verse 4, can we look at that? Abide in me as I abide in you. What jumped out at me was that little phrase, as I, as I. There's a promise in that. And it's the assumption that Jesus already is in us. Now that word abide is kind of an old time kind of word that means to dwell in a place, to stay in a place, to remain in a place, to be part of. And when Jesus says, as I abide in you, what strikes me is that he's assuming already that you know that he's with you, that he's in you, and that there's nothing that you can do about it. The question then is, are you going to be in him? Are we going to be in him? So this is a challenge and a promise for all of us who accept it. To all those who are willing to admit that apart from him, we can do nothing, or at least nothing good. There's a promise here that Jesus will continue to be with us and in us. We need that connection. How could we ever expect to do anything amazing with our lives unless they were connected back to the one who gave us those lives to begin with? It just doesn't make any sense. There's power in this connection. We're created for the purpose of this connection so that we would be able to know that we don't have to do all of this ourselves. And we've been given the gifts of the scripture. We've been given the gifts of worship and prayer and the opportunity to be together in a community so that we would continue to abide in him just as he abides in us. His expectation as a result is that our lives will bear fruit and then it won't be wild grapes that will be good grapes, good fruit. You know, today, one of the things that's exciting about today is that uh, we're going to receive 17 new members into our fellowship. I'm just overjoyed. We're going to celebrate two baptisms at the next service. One uh, for... A father and one for a son. These are great times that we live in here. And today my prayer for them, for these new members and for all of us, is that we might remain together connected to the source of our power, the source of our life, the one who already says, I abide in you, the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.